All right, welcome everybody. This is the Natural History Society of Maryland and I am Bronwyn Strong, the program coordinator here, welcoming you to our Thursday evening of natural history. And this night, we're going to be delving into micro mineral melting. And we're so excited and privileged to have a Hall of Famer, a Hall of Famer here. He is a member of the Micro Mounting, Micro Mineral Mounting Hall of Fame. So it's, we really have a rock star and that pun is intended um, with, with Mike here. He's an astron, uh, he is uh, has a PhD in astronomy um, and got into micro mounting minerals and micro minerals in the late 90s, I think 1999 is according to this biography, and it has just taken off um, from there. It's a real passion of his, and he's going to share it with us uh, this, this evening. So I am going to turn it over to Mike now. Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for coming and uh, sharing your knowledge with us tonight. Well, thank you, Bronwyn. It's very nice of you to uh, invite me. I love to talk about micromounting, but usually my friends slip away when I start. So now I've got you and I can tell you all about micromounting. I think, um, I think perhaps the thing I have to do this evening is convince you that I'm not crazy uh, because I collect microscopic minerals. That's called micromounting. And And I'm having, oh, there we go, okay. Um, collecting my mineral specimens so small you need a microscope to enjoy them. And perhaps I should say you need magnification to enjoy them. For example, here is a mineral specimen. This is hemimorphite. Uh, these transparent blades are about five millimeters long. Uh, the little, white thing at the bottom is calcite. I'm not sure how small it is. It's really quite small. The whole thing is about a half an inch in diameter. I think in millimeters and centimeters, so that's what I'm going to be using, but uh, uh, these are all quite small and they fit in little boxes. So a micromount is a mineral specimen that fits in a little box. The box is five eighths and uh, nine eighths, excuse me, um, well, it's a little bit less than an inch across, three quarters of an inch deep. There's a lid that goes on, you can't see the lid there, uh, but the mineral specimen is mounted permanently inside. So it's, it's cleaned and trimmed and you figure out what it is and where it came from and then you mount it in its own personal little display case. You put a label on the bottom uh, labels are really important. They tell you what's in the box, what the mineral is, also tell you where it came from. And micromounters always want to know where the mineral came from. So uh, this one came from uh, Mapimi in Mexico. I always put the chemical formula on my minerals. I just like to know what atoms are in it um, because I'm an astronomer and I know that zinc Zn is zinc. Zinc is made in supernova explosions. Massive stars a few times the mass of the sun have been exploding over the last 15 billion years and they have made the zinc in the universe. I just think that's cool. So I always put the formula on my minerals. The written number is a catalog number. So this is number 609 in my collection. This is one of the early ones that I got. So it has a low number. So why would anyone collect microscopic rocks? There's a few reasons. One reason is you can own beautiful minerals. They don't cost very much. A, a, a friend of mine looked at the mineral I just showed you, that hemimorphite, and he looked up from the microscope and he said, if that thing was a foot across, you'd really have something. Well, if it was a foot across, it would probably cost over $100,000 and I wouldn't have anything because I couldn't afford it but I can afford to own really beautiful minerals, but they're, they fit in little boxes 
and, uh, and they don't cost much. This hobby doesn't take up much room. I don't have a giant workshop. Uh, you could put the whole thing on a card table. So it's, it's great if you live in a uh, small house or an apartment or a little trailer or something, you, you can just set aside a corner for micromounting. And you can own some really unusual crystals, minerals that other collectors can't own because they don't make big crystals. So I'll show you some examples. Here's one, this is kaolacite from India. I like to know where things came from. This came from India. I just think this is a beautiful mineral. This was a little cavity in the rock and water seeping through the rock carried dissolved minerals through and filled this cavity with water and the minerals condensed out and formed crystals, little balls of crystals. And uh, this stuff is just, just beautiful. I love looking at this stuff, I love it. I bought this specimen from Neil Hubbard, who's a dealer from England, and I paid $3 for it. Uh, a big time spender, I can afford $3 for a mineral specimen. And this is what it looks like. It fits in its little box, it's mounted on a cork. It looks like a little bean and it's got beautiful crystals inside. And you can see from the uh, catalog number there that I'm up to, well, I'm up to over 5,400 at the moment. I really like calisite. I'd like to, I have quite a few of them and I'd, I wouldn't mind having some more. I'd, I really, I think I need some more. Hey, this Mike. isn't a problem. I can, I can stop anytime. Yeah, hey Mike, um, uh, uh, why do you use cork? Uh, they're handy. They're uh, easy to get and they're cheap, cost a penny or two a piece. You dip them in India ink so they're black and, uh, and they're just ready-made supports. And you can use your hobby knife to carve them. So the bottom of a rock may be really uh, irregular uh, and you can just cut off one corner of the cork and make the rock fit really real easy and glue it on with Elmer's glue and you're all set. Here's another mineral that I like. This is uh, the whole field of view here is about uh, five millimeters. So this is really quite small. Uh, it's malachite and cuprite. The green stuff here is malachite. Uh, if you have a malachite ring or malachite jewelry, uh, you see stuff that it's polished, smooth and shiny, but this is how malachite grows. It grows as little bitty fuzzy needles. Uh, this is all malachite here. The cuprite is these little blocky things and they're actually diamond shaped. They're octahedrons, they have eight sides. And cuprite is really dark red mineral, but the cuprite is a copper op oxide is reacting with water and carbon dioxide in the air and the surface is slowly changing into malachite. So there's more malachite coating the cuprite. This is malachite fuzz right on the cuprite. So uh, this, is, this is really pretty mineral specimen. I enjoy looking at this. This stuff up here um, is, um, is gothite which is kind of like rust. It's an iron oxide. I guess that's why it looks kind of rusty. Uh, and another reason I like this is where it comes from. It comes from Bisbee, Arizona. And Bisbee is a real cool town up in the mountains down south in Arizona. And the Copper Queen mine is a big copper mine there. It's uh, no longer in operation, but they give tours. So if you ever go to Bisbee, be sure and go to the Copper Queen mine and take the tour. And you can tell them I sent you, and they'll say who. Mike, how do you? How they're so beautiful. How are you lighting them um, to get the good photographs? I have, um, well, I have an expensive light that I bought a long time ago that shoots light right down onto them. It costs a couple hundred dollars. But lately, Ikea came out with little lamps, gooseneck uh, diode. Uh, LED lamps and they cost 10 bucks a piece. So for 20 bucks, I can get really bright light down on my minerals. And so anything that works, uh, you, you use it to light your minerals up. This is, uh, this is a nice little cluster of crystals, Lagrandite. 
there's zinc again, and there's uh, uh, a bunch of atoms. You can see the, the chemical formula. Um, this is a nice little cluster, and it is little. That's what it looks like in its box. It's a tiny little chip of rock, and it's actually mounted on a brush bristle, a bristle cut out of a hairbrush. Uh, and I found this on a giveaway table. It's actually uh, was mounted uh, by a famous uh, micromounter from Canada. And she did really beautiful work. And here this was on a giveaway table. And I'm gonna tell you later, later what a giveaway table is. That's teasing, isn't it? Well, if you wanna look at little minerals like this, you need magnification. And uh, a microscope is ideal. And so here's a microscope. This is me at my microscope, and I look happy as a clam because I'm at my microscope. And you can see the microscope has two eyepieces. They're stereo microscopes. This man in the background is looking through his microscope, two eyepieces, which means that you see three dimensions. Uh, the, the image you see is three dimensional. It makes a big difference. I'm showing you pictures that are two dimensional. I wish I could show you three dimensional pictures, but I can't. Um, but when you look through the microscope, they look really cool because they're in three dimensions. These microscopes are low power. Um, this one zooms from 10 to 20 times. That's not much. Um, um, my good microscope at home zooms up to 40 power and that's, that's plenty. Uh, just not a lot of magnification needed. Uh, you need an external light and this box on the bottom of the uh, microscope is a light that shines down on the mineral. The minerals aren't transparent, so you have to light them from above. Germs are transparent generally, so you light them from below and the light comes through, but a rock has to be illuminated from above. And like I say, uh, I have these cheap little diode lamps from Ikea now that work just fine shining down onto the mineral. And these microscopes really aren't that expensive. Um, I have friends that tell me, oh, I can't be a micromounter. I can't afford one of those microscopes. And then I say, how much did your cell phone cost? You spent $1,000 for a cell phone and you don't even know what most of the buttons do. For 350 bucks, you can buy a microscope and you can have a lot more fun with a microscope than you can with a cell phone. So yeah, a few hundred bucks you can buy a microscope. If you don't want to buy a microscope to start with, you can use a loop. A loop is just a magnifying glass, a good magnifying glass. This is a 10 power loop. You can buy them at rock shows. You can buy them in hobby shops. You can buy them on Amazon. Of course, you can buy them on Amazon. You can buy anything on Amazon. Uh, and if you like natural history, you probably already own a loop. So. Uh, you ought to use it and start looking at rocks and looking for crystals and see what you can find. You could start out lo looking at rocks with a loop. And here's a guy using a loop. You hold it up close to your eye and you bring the rock up closer to you until it comes into focus. And he's looking at a diamond. Well, a diamond is a rock. Well, some mineral specimens are just so small that you will eventually want a microscope. And I just find really small minerals kind of magical. They're so beautiful and yet they're so small. And so it's really fun to look at really small things. And here's an example. This is loperiite, cerium loperiite. You look at the formula, there's sodium, titanium. RE -E stands for rare earth elements. And in this case, it's mostly cerium. So this is an interesting rock. It contains interesting atoms. It comes from the Kola Peninsula in Russia. And I wonder if you know where the Kola Peninsula is. It's the Northwest corner of Siberia. It's almost entirely North of the Arctic Circle. It's stuck on the East side of Finland. And if you walked across Finland, you would be at the very North tip of Norway. That's an interesting place. And I don't think I'm ever gonna get there, but I have a rock from there. And so that's pretty cool. I like to think about that. And I like to know where my rocks come from because I kind of enjoy thinking about where they came from. Um, 
Loperiite forms cubes. The way the atoms link together forms a cube. And you can see there's a cube here. But look at this. There's another cube at an angle. There are two ways that the atoms can click together and they don't plan ahead. They're not thinking about what they're doing. They're just attracted to each other by electrostatic force. They click together like little Legos and some of them click in one way and some of them click in the other way. And in this case, they made two cubes that interpenetrate each other. This is called a, a, a twin. And uh, some people collect twins. They specialize in collecting twinned crystals. So this is really an interesting little, little rock. And by the way, I got it free by trading with another micromounter. This is what it looks like in its box. That's it. That little speck there glued in the center of a disc of paper is the loperiite crystal. You would never know that just looking at it. And it's really hard to see what's going on with a loop. You really need some magnification for the smallest of these. And I think it's the smallest of the minerals that are the most interesting. Here's another one. Hey, Mike, just a, a quick question um, from, the, from the group. Um, when you're looking at it uh, through a microscope, are you keeping it mounted while you're looking at it in the microscope? Or do you take it off? Um, yeah, you keep it mounted. You just open the lid, you lift off the little plastic lid and put the box under the microscope. It's safely mounted in its little box, like a display case. So you open the lid, you can look at it and enjoy it. And then you put the lid on and you put it back in, in your collection. So it's safe in its box. It's not gonna get, get damaged. And Lori um, is interested in how that, the, the mineral that you had just before that, I forgot the name of it. That how does it form, do you know? I don't know. That's interesting. I don't know. Um, hmm. I think the Kola Peninsula is kind of volcanic. I would have to look into that. Uh, yeah, huh. That's a good one. Uh, no idea. <laughs> Here's a, now this is a, a little thing too. This, this is a hole, a naturally occurring hole in the rock about two inches in diameter. And a hole in a rock is called a vug. So this is a vug. Some water circulating through here deposited crystals on the inside of the vug. But something else is going on. And if you had a loop, you could just barely make out these little hairs inside. You need a microscope to see them well. These are pyrite. They're pyrite wires. If you're familiar with pyrite, you know it perhaps as brassy cubes or brass colored big hunks. Well, this is pyrite and at this location, Sugar Grove, West Virginia, it forms wires. Um, they actually have a square cross section. Um, and this is really peculiar because this wire comes out here and it turns left and goes down here. Uh, I have no idea why. I've talked to a number of people. Uh, one person told me he was an expert and I didn't quite understand how his explanation could work either. Um, I don't know, I don't know. When you start magnifying things like this and looking carefully, you find all kinds of mysteries. But I love these little wires and lots of the vugs in this rock from uh, Sugar Grove contain pyrite wires. Here's another one I wanted to show you, the py this pyrite wire. Here's a pyrite wire that's pointed right at you. And it's coated with this brown stuff, another mineral called nontrinite. Some people think nontrinite is pretty ugly. I think it's ugly, but it's interesting. And it coated this wire. There's another wire back here that comes out this way. And it's coated with nontrinite except the wire turned left and went out this way and the nontronite refused to go along. Why won't the nontronite cover that pyrite wire? What's wrong with that wire? There's something funny going on here. And I've asked a few people who are supposed to know these things, why won't the nontronite cover that wire? And they shrug, I don't know. Um, there's something interesting going on here. Um, 
but these are so small you won't see them unless you have some magnification. Here's one I really want to show you. This is one of my favorite specimens, and I bought it for $2. Uh, this was the end of the day at a big rock show. I was really tired, and a dealer had a lot of old beat up micromounts, and he was getting rid of them for $2 a piece. And he had a folding chair, and I'm so glad he had a folding chair. If he hadn't had a folding chair, I would have walked past. But I sat down in the folding chair and I started looking at these things and there was a micromount there that had a little white chip of rock. It's calcite. Well, big deal, calcite. And as I turned it under the light, I got a little glint of something. I could just barely see it with the loop. And I had to take it over to where the light was really good and turn it at just the right angle. And I could see the pyrite flag sticking up. And I bought it right away. This is a pyrite wire coming up out of the calcite. And for some reason, I don't know why, it formed a tag sticking out here that looks like a flag. So this is a pyrite flag sticking up out of the calcite. And I, I was thrilled to find that. I almost missed it. It was so small. I named some of my specimens, not all of them, but this one I had to give a name. And I named this one Tranquility Base. So where do you get rocks? Well, outdoors is full of rocks. This is me and my wife on a trail uh, and we're hiking along and there's a lot of rocks. So you just start paying attention to rocks. I have picked up rocks in parking lots. Uh, anywhere there's rocks, there might be crystals. And if you've got a loop, if you've got a microscope at home, pick some up and take a look at them. However, there's no collecting here. This is my favorite place in the universe. It's the Grand Canyon. I'm one of the owners of the Grand Canyon and we don't allow collecting there. It's forbidden. Millions of people visit the Grand Canyon. If everybody who came to the Grand Canyon picked up a rock and took it home in a few years, there'd be nothing there but a big hole in the ground. So you don't collect in parks, national parks, state parks, city parks, county parks. Uh, mineral collectors know that, you know that. Uh, there are places where you can't collect. Private property. You, you really need the permission of the person. You, you can't jump a fence and go out there and start picking up rocks, you need the permission of the owner. And sometimes it's hard to figure out who owns a certain piece of land and how to find them and how to get permission and so forth. So one of the things you can do is join a rock club. And here's uh, the Baltimore Mineral Society uh, meets at the Natural History Museum and, uh, and there are people in the club, I don't know how they do it, but they know how to get in touch with quarries and and the private owners and get permission to go rock collecting. And so every once in a while they organize a collecting trip and people go off and they, they uh, collect rocks. And so you can find nice interesting rocks out in the quarry or wherever. And uh, here's a group out collecting and picking up stuff. They got their buckets and their tools and they're having a lot of fun on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, and she has found something really cool. Look at the size of that rock in her palm. Um, she's very proud of it, so that must be a nice rock. Uh, I don't know what it is, but uh, she's going to need some magnification to take a look at. It. And if you join a, a mineral club, a mineral clubs sometimes have sales. Um, someone will bring in rocks to sell, and you can buy rocks. And sometimes they'll come bring rocks to give away. If they've been out collecting and they've got a whole bucket of stuff, they'll bring in the leftovers and, uh, and you can get rocks that way. Uh, by the way, you can learn a lot at a mineral club just by asking questions or even by just hanging around and listening to what other people are talking about. That's what I did when I first joined a mineral club. I was kind of shy, so I just listened and I learned a lot of stuff. Or, you could attend a Micromount conference, which is a very strange kind of conference. Everybody who comes brings a microscope. Look at all the microscopes in this picture. And they bring boxes and buckets and trays of rock. 
to look at and to show off and to trade and to give away and to buy and to sell. And so everybody has a really good time. And if you start looking at people in these photographs, you'll discover everybody is smiling. In this picture, somebody has just finished giving a talk or something and people are taking pictures of them. So, so that's cool. We have a good time at our mineral conferences. This conference is a conference that I run. It's the Desertels Micromount Conference run by the Baltimore Mineral Society every October, except last October when we had to do it by Zoom. And it wasn't very satisfying because we couldn't trade rock by Zoom. <coughs> I just wanted to show you a picture of a couple friends of mine who are smiling like idiots. I'm sorry, they are. Uh, Mike and Karen are mineral collectors and they've got their microscopes. And oh, and there's those inexpensive little gooseneck lamps. See that? And they're very handy uh, to light up uh, rocks under a microscope. And, uh, and so they've got a tray here with some rocks and they're, and they're gonna look at those mineral specimens and they're having a good time. Mike, by the way, is just a brilliant photographer of Micromounts. Dealers come to Micromount conferences and, um, and they, this dealer has set up an entire table of Micromounts for sale, typically a few dollars a piece. Um, there must be a th over a thousand uh, mineral specimens here, probably a lot more than that. And uh, you can see this lady has a box and she's filling it up with mineral specimens and she'll take those to her microscope and take a look at them. And this fellow has a, his loop with him and he's looking at them right at the table uh, to pick out the ones that he wants. Um, these typically cost a few dollars. This dealer, expensive, expensive minerals, for the, from this dealer might cost six or eight dollars. I don't think I've seen one that costs ten dollars. Uh, he's very reasonable and has really nice stuff, really. Looking at this picture really makes me want to go shopping right now. And we have auctions. We have a voice auction at our mineral conference uh, where we hold up a little rock and people shout out their bids and it's uh, kind of fun and kind of exciting and people fight to own a rock and they typically sell for a few dollars. Um, uh, once in a while, one goes for more than $10 and that's kind of exciting. Uh, and this is a silent auction. So these mineral specimens here are for sale and you get about an hour and a half to walk around the table and look at everything and you write your bid down on the bid slip and it, when the timer goes off, the highest bid wins the rock to take it home. So that's another way to get rocks to look at under a microscope. And I wanna, want you to look in the back of this room. There's tables back there. I don't have a good picture of them. Those are the giveaway tables. They're full of boxes and buckets and egg cartons and trays full of leftover rock. It's good stuff. It's full of crystals and neat stuff. Somebody dug it up somewhere and they, they took what they wanted and the leftovers they brought to the mineral conference just to give away. And uh, you can spend hours and hours going over the giveaway tables. I've, I've found lots of pretty stuff on the giveaway tables um, at mineral conferences. Another thing you can do is go to a rock show. There's a few rock shows that take place in Baltimore, and this year has been a very bad year because we can't have rock shows and get together, but better times are coming, and uh, maybe in 2021 we can have some rock shows right there in Baltimore. Uh, there's some in neighboring towns and cities, and if you start paying attention, you will discover rock shows, and you can go, and there are dealers selling rocks. This is a picture of a small part of the big uh, gem and mineral show in Tucson, Arizona that takes place every February. Not this February, not this February, uh, but maybe next February. Um, about half of these dealers are selling jewelry, but the other half are selling mineral specimens. And so you can have a really good time walking around look, shopping for mineral specimens. Not all of them are micromounts. Only a few dealers are selling micromounts, 
but many dealers are selling small inexpensive rocks and you can take them home and trim them down and put them in your micromount boxes. And so I get a lot of micromount material by buying uh, small minerals for a few dollars from dealers uh, that uh, uh, aren't thinking about micromounts. I wanted to show you this picture. This is a fluorite cube. I'm not sure, but remember, I think this distance here was six or eight inches. This is a huge fluorite cube. These little things down here are calcites. This was on display at the Tucson show, and I took this picture because it was almost unbelievable. It was such a big fluorite cube. It's just kind of plain white. It's not purple like most fluorite, but um, but it's a pretty it's pretty big, is what it is. And it's from an interesting place in Dalnagorsk in Russia. It's too bad you weren't with me that day because if you had been with me, you could have bought this cube. It would have cost you seventy five thousand dollars. That's the price, $75,000. That is not micromounting. I buy things for $2, $3. I'll spring sometimes for four or five, but I'm cheap. And I'm proud of being cheap. These days, somebody who isn't cheap is probably making a big mistake. So I buy micromounts for a few dollars. I don't spend $75,000 on a giant cube of fluorite. It's a broken cube. Did you notice that? This part of back here is broken and there's a big chunk out of it here. Micromounters are accustomed to seeing perfect crystals because when you look through the microscope, you've got a whole handful of little rocks and you just go through them until you find the very best crystal you can find. And it usually doesn't have any dings or cracks or chips. It's usually perfect. It may only be a millimeter high, but it's perfect. So we're used to looking at really pretty crystals, not broken crystals. I heard someone who is really an expert on mineral collecting talk, and he said, these big rocks that cost $75,000 are trophy rocks. Yeah, I guess there are people who buy these, maybe they buy them as an investment. I don't, I, I wouldn't do that. Maybe they spend $75,000 to buy this rock and they hope that it'll be worth a hundred thousand in a couple years or maybe they're just showing off for their neighbors or maybe they're showing off for themselves but i can't afford seventy five thousand dollar rocks i can't afford hundred dollar rocks i'm looking for micromounts and they're inexpensive well how do crystals form we should take just a moment to talk about that this is a diagram that's supposed to show some molecules of minerals floating in water and they are attracted to each other by electrostatic uh, uh, forces and they click together and they're forced to click together in certain ways. It's like Lego blocks. If you've ever tried to build a round tower out of Lego blocks, you know what I'm talking about. They only click together in certain ways. And the molecules click together like little uh, atomic Legos and they build a crystal. This is quartz. And because they have to cl click together in certain ways, they form flat faces and sharp edges. So the crystals that you may have seen are the sh whatever shape they are, that shape is determined by the molecules that click together to make them. Different chemical compounds click together in different ways. Here's a mineral, uh, here's a, a, a crystal that you might know. That's a water crystal, it's a snowflake. And I have a friend uh, who photographs snowflakes and she's very good at it. And when it snows, she goes out in her backyard with her microscope and catches snowflakes on velvet and photographs them. She'll be uh, doing a presentation for us next week. Yes. This is something I've always wanted to do, but somehow taking a card table and a microscope out in a snowstorm doesn't appeal to me. So I haven't tried it yet. But here's a crystal. The atoms link together in certain ways, they produce a certain shape and a very pretty shape. Here's another crystal. I found this. 
Uh, I got a rock off of a giveaway table. It was about the size of a golf ball. It came from Indian Mountain in Alabama, which is known for phosphate minerals. And I took it home and I started breaking it up into little pieces. And I started looking at each little piece, turning it over under my microscope. And I turned one of those pieces over and here was a whole cluster of stringite crystals. These are really cool, really pretty. And, and under my zoom, under my stereo microscope, it's in three dimensions. So uh, this was really a nice discovery under my microscope. This whole cluster is about a millimeter in diameter. It's really quite small, but it's really quite beautiful. Mike, Faith wants to know, and it kind of goes along with what you said, how do you cut those minerals down that you get that are big? And how do you figure out what part of the rock may be something that's, that's interesting? I have rock breakers. I'll show you one in a few minutes. You okay. can put a rock in there and turn the crank and, and break it. It doesn't always break the way you want it to break. And one of the worst things that can possibly happen in micro mounting is that you pick up a rock and you see an absolutely gorgeous crystal right in a certain place. And then you have to try to break the rock and not mess up that crystal. And sometimes the rock doesn't break the way you want and it, and it messes up your crystal. Uh, but sometimes you break an ugly rock and you look inside and there's a beautiful crystal. So it kind of evens out. And that's the way this was. This is orichalcite, uh, which is a copper mineral. A lot of copper minerals are green or blue. And this is kind of a beautiful uh, uh, green. Uh, this came off a giveaway tape. A chunk of rock. I took it home. I started breaking it up in little pieces and I turned over a piece and here was a vug. The vug is almost the size of this photograph. You can see the darkness down in the vug. And in the middle was this cluster. This is about four millimeters in diameter. Uh, so this is a beautiful little cluster of delicate orichalcite um, uh, crystals. And I got it into a micromount box to protect it so it won't get damaged. And, uh, and I can take it any time I want and look at it under my microscope. Um, Mike, Lloyd wants to know, how do you identify those minerals when you're looking at them? Uh, that's the hard part. Um, and I'm not good at identifying minerals. I have friends that can just look at a mineral and say, oh yeah, that's, you know, that's linoleum. No, I, I can't identify minerals. Um, one of the reasons I think I'm not good at going into a quarry and digging up minerals is I don't know what I'm digging. Uh, but I go to rock shows and uh, micromount symposia where people have identified things and the rocks come with little labels stuck on them. That's handy. Um, but sometimes I get a mineral and it has beautiful things in it and then I don't know what it is. And that's what happened here. I got a rock off the giveaway table from the Great Southern Mine in Arizona and I found these needles, these, these yellow orange needles in the rock. And I could not figure out what it was. And I started searching on the web and I found pictures of rocks from the Great Southern Mine. And some of those had little needles in it. And people said, that's wolfenite. Now, if you know minerals, you know that wolfenite forms plates, thin um, golden yellow orange plates, not at the Great Southern Mine. I don't know what it is. It's something about the, the, the temperature and the pressure and, and the acidity. And I don't know what it is. Nobody does. Uh, nobody tells me what it is. Uh, but there, the wolfenite forms needles. And so these are wolfenite needles. This is one of my favorite photographs. Um, beautiful little spray of wolfenite needles. Um, uh, that was a cool evening when I turned over a rock and I found this stuff because I had to figure out what it was. I couldn't throw it away. There's a curse in micromounting. It's called rock too nice to throw away. It accumulates in boxes and buckets and tubs and trays. And if you're not careful, it'll fill your basement, your garage, your dining room. So you have to give it away. And so you take it to micromount meetings and you put it on the giveaway table. That's where that stuff comes from. 
So this was rock too good to throw away and I had to figure out what it was. And I did that by going onto the web and finding other rocks from this location. And that's one of the reasons location is important. It'll help you figure out what the stuff is. Oh, I wanted to show you this. Uh, I bought this. I bought this from a dealer and I think I paid $10 for it. It's gold. And this is about four millimeters long and it's gold crystal. Gold forms crystals. Lots of little crystals stuck together and that formed this. Crystallized gold is really pretty. And you may be familiar with nuggets of gold, but nuggets of gold are hunks of gold that have been tumbled down mountain streams and they've been worn down and all the pretty stuff has been worn away and there's nothing left but a lump. Uh, crystallized gold is really pretty. When I bought this, I was sure that I was gonna name it the dragon. You see a dragon? But the more I have looked at it, I'm pretty sure it, this should be named Cleopatra's barge. There's Cleopatra riding right along on it. Oh, I wanted to show you diamonds. These are natural diamonds, the way they come out of the ground. Um, uh, uh, this one is from South Africa. This one's from Zaire. They're each about a millimeter in diameter. They have not been cut and polished. This is way, the way diamonds form. When we get diamonds, we humans grind them down and facet them and polish them and make them look real pretty. But I think they look kind of pretty coming right out of the ground. I bought these from a dealer. And as I remember, I paid about $2 a piece for them. So how do you make a micromount? Here, I'll show you what, uh, what we have to do. I found a rock that had some crystals in it. I used my loop and I could see there was something in it. So I took it home and I used my little rock breaker, which is about six inches high. And I broke it into pieces and I put the little pieces on sticky putty just to hold them steady. And I went through to find the very best little pieces with crystals in it. And the very best one is the center one and I used Elmer's glue and glued it on top of a little plastic spike. That little spike came off the hairbrush. You're familiar with hairbrushes that have real thick bristles with little balls on the end. Well, you cut the ball off, you've got a little plastic spike, and you glue your rock on there, and it's stuck in a bit of putty to, so it'll stand up for the picture. Uh, this was a bigger piece, and I glued it on a cork that had been dipped in India ink. And this little piece had a really nice crystal on it, but it was so small. So I turned it over face down and I used a bristle. This is a bristle from a hairbrush, a little thin bristle. And I used some sticky uh, putty to stick the bristle to a piece of wood. And I put a dab of Elmer's on the end of the bristle and set it down so it just touched the mineral. When the glue dries, you can pick it off the putty and put it in a box. So here's two of those specimens in boxes. And I print labels on my computer that fit right in the box. And so this is Schaeferite. Um, it's from a, an ancient slag dump in Greece. And it says, I bought this from Gunnar Farber. Gunnar comes from Germany. And he has all kinds of really interesting minerals. Um, so I'm always looking for his booth at a rock show. Here's an example of a nicely mounted mineral. Um, this thing is about three millimeters in diameter. It's really quite small. These are natrolite crystals. Uh, I always think they look like glass, but uh, they're natrolite. Um, and this was mounted by Randy Rothschild. Randy isn't with us anymore. He used to be a member of the Baltimore Mineral Society. And he made beautiful micromounts, really gorgeous. Not only were they beautiful rocks, nicely trimmed, but they were beautifully mounted. And so this, this micromount is really nice. And I found this on a silent, in a silent auction. And I bought it for just a two or three dollars. I always watch for his mounts uh, because he did such beautiful work. So one of the things you can do is besides collecting really neat minerals, you can collect people. You, you'll begin to notice people who make really nice mounts 
and you'll say, oh, I want that one. Vi Anderson made that one. Yeah, you want to you watch for hers. Here's one that was given to me by a friend. Uh, this is malachite, but for some reason it's forming toadstools. This is the strangest thing I've ever seen. Um, I ran into my friend at a, at, at a show once. He pulled out a little plastic bag and he said, here, I brought you something. And here was a mount of malachite. Uh, I just think that is so cool. No idea what is going on. That's a mystery. Um, but it was a gift. There is so much beautiful rock out there that people can just give it away. And so it's not unusual to have someone just hand you a rock and say, here, I got this for you. Oh, I wanted to show you this. This is stupid, but I want to show you anyway. This is a tiny little quartz crystal. I got a bunch of them off the giveaway table. It is less than a millimeter in diameter. And I glued it on a squirrel whisker. Now a squirrel whisker grows on a squirrel. It's a real squirrel whisker. And the way you get squirrel whiskers is you drive down the road and you watch for squirrels that are done with their whiskers. And you pull over and you get your forceps and you go back and you harvest a few squirrel whiskers. They're very stiff. They're very small and you can use Elmer's and you can glue a crystal right on them. I don't do this very often. I did it this time because an old friend of mine loved to talk about mounting crystals on squirrel whiskers. And I, I was thinking about him <laughs> and I thought I ought to mount a crystal uh, just for my friend. So I mounted it on a squirrel whisker. There are no rules. Micromounting, there are almost no rules at all. Maybe one rule is you ought to know where your rock came from. Location is kind of important. But if you want to use a cork or a squirrel whisker or a brush bristle, whatever will hold the bristle that hold the crystal in place is okay. Oh, I said micromounting doesn't take up much room. Let me show you something. These are display cases for big crystals. Do you collect big crystals? If you do, you've got to have display cases to put them in. Uh, maybe you're one of those trophy collectors, I don't know. Um, but if you do, you've got these, these big cases. I have heard about a married couple in Texas that have dozens and dozens of these cases. They've got them in every room of their house, including the bathroom and the kitchen. And they just built a new wing on their house so they could buy more display cases for their minerals. they obviously have a lot more lunch money than I do. But if you collect big crystals, you need big cases. Let me show you my collection. My entire collection at the moment is 5,415 mineral specimens in little plastic boxes. And they fit in this display cabinet, uh, not a display cabinet, sorry, storage cabinet. Um, I built that myself for $90 worth of lumber from Lowe's. Uh, you can see the drawers are half empty, so I've got room to add more minerals. Uh, the whole thing takes up about a third the space of a regular refrigerator. So my collection doesn't take up very much space. If you live in a small place, uh, micromounting is for you. Um, there are, as of today, 5,662 mineral species known but only about 200 of them produce mineral crystals that are as big as your thumb. So if you're gonna collect crystals that you can see with the naked eye, you're limited to a couple hundred minerals. Sorry, you can't collect the others because they're too small. Most minerals only form microscopic crystals, but micromounters collect microscopic crystals so we can collect a whole lot of stuff. I've got 1,442 different minerals in my collection, and that's not unusual. That, that just happened. I just do this for fun. You know, I'm not trying to set any records or anything. I'm just fooling around. And I wound up with 1,442 different minerals. So I can collect a lot of different minerals that the collectors of large crystals can't collect. Uh, here's an example. This is rhabdophane, another cerium mineral, cerium phosphate, and um, these crystals are about two millimeters long. Um, 
that's cool. That's an unusual mineral. I have it in my collection. Uh, it isn't in those big display cabinets that I showed you before. Oh, this is my workspace. You could put that whole thing on a card table. This is my home computer. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> that's my home microscope. You can see these gooseneck lamps that light the minerals up. Uh, this is my little bitty workspace for little bitty rocks. There's a box of tools. Uh, there's some rocks that need working on. And uh, oh, I, this is a little digital microscope that I bought for fun. It's uh, about $150 and it's really cool, but you don't see three dimensions looking at that screen. If you look through a stereo microscope, you see in three dimensions and that's, uh, that's really cool. Mike, um, Lloyd was yes. you use uh, removable glue and if so, what kind? It's Elmer's glue, just white glue. A friend of mine in Canada said he won't use Elmer's glue because uh, it's not archival glue and he has a special glue that he buys. And I said, Quentin, I just do this for fun. I'm not gonna worry about archival glue. I'm just fooling around. So Elmer's glue works fine. Uh, <clears throat> and by the way, if, if you make a mistake, you can soak the mineral off the cork because Elmer's glue will eventually soften in water. So Elmer's glue, it just works fine. I have seen micromounts mounted with hot glue, which is just horrible. I'm embarrassed to mention that. Let's not talk about that anymore. And and um, the Millers are interested in your photography. And I don't know if it shows in this picture or not, but are you capturing these images via computer feed? <laughs> or you attach a unique macro lens to the light? Uh, I'm going to show you some uh, 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 something uh, a little bit more about photography later. But yeah, okay. I bought this microscope because it could take a camera adapter and there's a Pentax digital camera up there. And I take pictures through my microscope. I'll show you, I'll show you in, a, in a couple slides uh, how, how you can do that. All right, great. But that's a lot of fun. Taking pictures is a lot of fun. I wanted to show you this. Do you know who the Beagle Boys were? No, don't know who the Beagle Boys were. See, I was privileged to grow up in a home where I was allowed to read comic books, a literary experience. And in Mickey Mouse comic books, sometimes in Donald Duck comic books, there was a band of criminals. They were called the Beagle Boys and you can see their masks and the numbers on their chest. Um, the Beagle Boys were robbers and burglars. They were criminals. They were bad guys. And I just wonder if you collect trophy minerals. Because if you do, your cabinets are full of really expensive minerals, in which case you should have an alarm system. You should have special locks on your doors. You should have an insurance policy to ensure your mineral collection, right? But if you collect micromounts, the Beagle Boys wouldn't bother with micromounts. What, they're $2 a piece, $3 a piece? Don't bother me, I'm going down the street. Yeah, so it's, it's inexpensive and you don't build up a huge expensive collection that you have to start worrying about. I wanted to show you this. I, I was breaking up a rock and I turned over a piece of it and I found a bug. This is about four millimeters in diameter and inside was a sea urchin. Actually, it's not a sea urchin. The little needles sticking out here are tupersuatsiaite. Now you should have tupersuatsiaite in your collection. You should do that because it's a lot of fun to say. The little black specks are actually dark red and they're manganoneptunite. Ne manganoneptunite is almost as much fun to say as tupersuatsiaite. Uh, they come from the Eris quarry in Namibia. And uh, it was it really a thrill to find this. It's so beautiful down in there. I got it off the giveaway table for free. It is not worth stealing. If I could sell it, I would probably get two or three dollars for it. it. It's free stuff and it's beautiful. 
uh, I want to mention a couple other ways that you could enjoy mineral collecting, especially micro mineral. Uh, fluorescence. Here's a rock. It just looks like a rock. But if you put a UV light on it, it lights up. There's two different minerals there. One glows blue and one glows orange. And here's another rock. This is from Franklin, New Jersey. And a lot of rocks from Franklin, New Jersey fluoresce. They glow under a UV light. Look at that. There's four different minerals there that glow. And if you have a UV light, you can start looking at rocks and see which ones fluoresce. And I check all of my micromounts to see if any of them fluoresce. By the way, fluorescence has nothing to do with radioactivity. So you can collect fluorescent rocks and, and they are not radioactive, they just glow. It's just light and they're not dangerous and it's lots of fun. And I just do this for fun. I'm not a professional micromounter. I never heard of such a thing, but I'm not one. I just do this for fun. And there's the flashlight that you could get. It used to be a UV light was really expensive, but you can get a UV light now for $10. You can buy them in pet stores and, and uh, rock stores and uh, rock shows, and you can buy them on Amazon. Of course, you can buy them on Amazon. You can buy anything on Amazon. I wanted to show you this. If you collect micromounts, they're little rocks. You can collect radioactive rocks. This rock was at the Tucson show and I took a picture of it in a big case. This thing was the size of your head. It's torbernite. Look at that in the formula. That U means uranium. This is, this is radioactive. I'm not an expert, but I think this is much too big to have in your house. I hope you don't put this on a shelf in your kitchen or on your dining room table. You should not have a big radioactive rock like this around. But if you're collecting little bitty rocks, little bitty radioactive rocks aren't dangerous. And I can, I can explain how this way. Bananas contain potassium. And one isotope of potassium is radioactive, naturally radioactive. It's not very radioactive, but bananas are radioactive. Yes, they are. Uh, so is salt substitute, it's potassium chloride. But bananas are safe. I've heard of people that eat bananas. You've probably got bananas in your house right now. But bananas are safe because you don't ever come in contact with hundreds of bananas at one time. Oh no, you never do that. But even hundreds of bananas aren't really radioactive enough to be dangerous. It's not like you run into truckloads of bananas or boatloads of bananas. Bananas are safe. So you should be able to collect radioactive minerals if they're banana teeny, if they are equivalent to only a few bananas. And here's a rock. This is castellite. It's a radioactive mineral. Look at the formula. There's the U for uranium. These little crystals contain uranium. They are radioactive. The field of view here is one millimeter. So this is a tiny little cluster of crystals. And I did the math. I, I figured it out as best I could. This is about as radioactive as one bunch of bananas. So you can estimate the radioactivity of a, of a micromount of radioactive rock in banana equivalents. So this is safe. You can, you, can, you can keep that in your house. Please don't worry about it. Here's another one. Um, this is autonite. Look at the formula. There's that U for uranium. By the way, this one happens to fluoresce, but that has nothing to do with radioactivity. Yes, it fluoresces, big deal. Um, Lots of rocks fluoresce and they're not radioactive. This one happens to be radioactive. Um, this one, I did the math and I think it is worth about one stalk of bananas. You know, one big stalk, you, you fling that thing over your shoulder and unload it, take it down from the boat and you sing that banana song. Uh, well, that, that's a lot of bananas. I'm glad I don't have to eat that many bananas. 
But on the other hand, it's not dangerous radioactivity. So I think I can have this in my collection safely. On the other hand, I would not carry this in my pocket. I wouldn't eat it. And I'll wash my hands when I'm done working with this rock. It is radioactive, but not very much. The banana equivalent is really quite small. Oh, here's another piece of autunite I wanted to show you just because it's so pretty. It fluoresces so bright. Uh, yeah, this contains uranium. It's about a centimeter long, and uh, it's not very many bananas uh, equivalents there. Well, someone asked about photography, so let me talk a little bit about it. I bought this microscope uh, a long time ago when I didn't know as much as I know today. In fact, I didn't know very much at all. Um, but I picked this out because it had a port back here that let me attach a camera. And this is a Nikon digital camera like you would take to the zoo to photograph the polar bears. Uh, I've taken the lens off and attached it to the microscope and I can take pictures through the microscope. This is a picture I took through the microscope. This is one of my most successful photographs. I think this looks really nice. Um, uh, this is malachite. Uh, I, oh, excuse me. This is rosacite. Yes, it's a copper mineral, so it looks kind of green. Um, and uh, I think that's kind of pretty. These these balls here down at the bottom are out of focus because they're a little bit closer to you, and the ones in the background are out of focus because they're a little bit further away. But I think this looks like a, a pretty good photograph, and I took that myself. All of the photographs of micromounts that I have been showing you are photographs that I took of my own rocks. So um, whatever you saw is what I'm able to do. But there's a problem, and here's the problem. This is Arianite from Northern Ireland, and I just took this photograph a few nights ago, and it's okay. It's not as good as it could be. I have friends that take gorgeous, beautiful photographs they know more about it than I do, and they have better equipment, but I managed to get this photograph. The problem is that if you focus on the top crystal in the bunch, the bottom crystals are out of focus. This thing is about two millimeters in diameter and a millimeter deep. It's like a little bowl. If I photograph on the, if I, if I focus on the crystals on the bottom of the bowl, the crystals on the top are out of focus. So what I do is I take a photograph with the top crystal in sharp focus, and then I take more photographs and I keep moving the focus down slowly, step by step, all the way to the bottom of the bowl. I got 48 photographs over a distance of about one millimeter. And then I used a computer program um, uh, to combine them, and the computer program keeps only the sharpest parts of each photograph, and it puts them all together. And when you're done, everything from top to bottom is supposed to be in focus. This is about the best I can do with the equipment I've got and what I know about it and my level of patience. I have friends that take beautiful photographs and I have kind of decided that they're gonna take photographs and I'm gonna let them do that, but I'm not gonna to try to compete with them because what I really love is the minerals, not the photographs. But if you love photography, you could make a really interesting hobby photographing uh, micromounts through your microscope. Oh, I wanted to show you this. This vug here, oh, excuse me, I'm ahead of myself. Well, I don't think it's gonna let me go backwards. That's weird. Um, up, up, up. The ghost is taken over here. Now, all right, this is where we are. Um, this vug is about a millimeter in diameter. So these little hairs are really tiny and um, they're actually individual crystals curved in some cases. The ones in the bottom are, are very hard to photograph along with the ones on the top. So it takes a lot of photographs stacked and combined to get this kind of, of 
a photograph with everything in focus. This is kersutite. Um, kersutite does form crystals as big as your thumb, but they are ugly black hunks of gunk. You wouldn't throw them at a duck. They're ugly things. But micromounters see tiny little crystals that are so thin they're transparent. The light can go through them. The light can go in and reflect back out. And so you see the colors. And these are really pretty. So micromounters see a lot of beauty that the collectors of larger, crystal, uh, larger crystals can't see. And by the way, kersutite is a kind of a rare mineral. Most people wouldn't have that in their collection if they were, if unless they were a micromounter. So, micromounters can collect a lot of, a lot of interesting crystals, even some rare crystals, because they're quite small. Uh, oh, another thing you could do, and this is a, a way that you might like to sh direct your collection of micromounts. You could collect gemstones. Um, the ruby over there on the left is just the way it came out of the ground in India. It's about four millimeters in diameter. Those triangular shapes are formed as the ruby grows, just as the crystal grows. That's the way it works. Um, that's that. Remember the diamonds I showed you. You will put the diamonds in your gemstone collection, along with rubies and emeralds and and sapphires and all kinds of interesting crystals that, that you could collect. Or you could collect native metals, that is metals that form naturally in the soil. They're not refined or anything. That's the way that copper came out of the ground. Copper crystals, remember the gold crystals that I showed you? Well, copper forms crystals too. Some copper crystals are really gorgeous. Um, so you could collect uh, native minerals. I wanted to show you this piece of platinum simply because it's so ugly. That's a nugget. It has tumbled down a stream over and over and over and banged against rocks and all the pretty stuff has been worn away and all that's left is a lump. That's what a nugget is. It's a lump. Uh, so this is interesting. I think it's interesting because I don't have much platinum in my collection. Um, but it's not crystals. So we collect microscopic minerals mostly because they're really beautiful. Uh, nature is beautiful, both big and small. I'm an astronomer, so I'm accustomed to what is big. This is the Milky Way galaxy. Actually, it's not the Milky Way galaxy. Nobody has a selfie stick that long that we can take a picture of our galaxy. This is the Andromeda galaxy, which looks just the way we think our galaxy would look from outside. And if this was our galaxy, then our sun would be a star over here and we would be going around it on the Earth. There's about 300 billion stars in our galaxy. Galaxies are really, really, really big, and really, really, really far away, and you don't see them because they're too big and they're too far away. We're medium creatures, we're stuck. We live between astronomically large things and microscopically small things. And we don't see either one. They're too big or they're too small. So I, I hope my talk has opened your eyes, so to speak, and you will start to think about some magnification and you'll start looking at rocks and crystals. This is a strontianite crystal uh, it's a bundle of strontianite crystals that formed a little cross. A friend of mine gave it to me and she didn't know it. She just gave me a chunk of rock and I took it home and broke it up. And one evening I turned over a rock and there was a vug. And down in the vug was this strontianite cross. Little bitty things can be really beautiful. And so I hope you will get some magnification, a loop, or a microscope, and you'll start to look at little bitty things. When you do, look at bugs and flowers and all kinds of little things, but don't forget to look at rocks and look for vugs and look for crystals because they're really, really pretty. So thank you very much for zooming in and listening to you. Uh, listening to me, you have been a very uh, quiet and attentive audience. Thank you very much.
No, thank you, Mike. This was phenomenal. I am so excited. Um, it, it really just, you get to see a completely different part of the world that we don't get to see. Um, one question we did have, Julia was interested, are there any online image galleries of these type of specimens that you know of? Uh, there are. There are, and you can just search for minerals, search for uh, uh, micro mounts, and and see what you can find. But I would, I was thinking about directing you to a um, a website that is called mindat.org. M-I-N-D-A-T dot org. Uh, it's run by a man and woman in England. And it is free and it is fabulous. I think every known mineral is there with gazillions of photographs of them. Since most minerals only form microscopic crystals, most of the photographs are of microscopic crystals. And so you can, you can go there and just look at all the pictures. But if you want to know what the chemical composition of a rock is, they've got all the technical detail. And you can look up the atomic structure and the electrical permeability and all the stuff I don't need to know. Uh, it, all that data is there. Uh, and for that matter, you can look up a mine and find out what minerals are found there. Or you can look up a mineral and find out what mines that mineral is found in. So when you're trying to identify a mineral, one of the ways of doing it is to go to that website, Mindat. Dot org. I hope you'll try that because it is a really cool place. Um, do, could you share the program that merges? That, what is the name of the program that you use with the photography that merges all the layers? To uh, there's, a, there's a couple different ones, but I use Helicon. And that's a commercial program that you have to pay for. And I bought a lifetime license cost me a few lunch money, uh, but it's a cool program and it lets you put these uh, photographs together. Um, the hardest part of getting those photographs is patience. Just sit there and turn the knob by a tiny amount and click the button on and on and on and on. And then you get a whole lot of these photographs and you can put them together. Um, and I really enjoy doing it. Uh, Sometimes I see a mineral and I know it's going to be hard to photograph and I kind of dread doing it, but um, I can do it. It seems to me it could be very, very um, zen, very relaxing. Zen, yes, yes. In a, in a way, very relaxing. There's a lot of tension involved too because I mess up sometimes. But I have friends that have really nice equipment and they really know how to do this and they take such fabulous photographs. I'm almost embarrassed to show mine, um, but nobody has complained here tonight yet. So uh, I guess that's okay, but uh, I'm gonna let them take the photographs and I'm gonna collect the minerals. Any qu other questions for, for Mike? This is your time. Well, Mike, everybody looks a lot smarter than they did when we started. So you did a great job. And now it's, now it's everybody else's turn to take this knowledge and share it with other people because that's what, that's what, uh, that's what we're supposed to do. Oh, how did you get started in doing this? They wants to know. Me? Yep. Oh, well, I've always liked rocks since I was a little boy and my uncle gave me a rock collection in a box uh, and uh, every once in a while my brother my younger brother would spill all the rocks out of the box and I would have to put them back in the right places and so I kind of enjoyed that and later on my daughter was interested in picking up rocks when she was just a, two or three years old and I started trying to explain to her what the different rocks were and I started reading about it and that became my hobby and she became a geo major in college and uh, that's the family hobby and I went to rock shows and I, I discovered that I mostly liked looking through the microscope at little rocks. And uh, finally I ran into some people and 
And they said, if you want to do this, you got to get some magnification. So I bought a microscope and, and started out. And it's like you say, it's kind of a Zen experience. Yeah, because you're seeing things that you, you're walking past them and you just see this whole new world that's, that, that you don't, don't even know that exists. I see a world that most people don't see in astronomy and in mineralogy. Right, both of the extremes. Um, and when are the, is the Baltimore Mineral Society meeting online monthly or, or y'all just not doing anything right now during the community? We have been holding our meetings online. We have been holding them by Zoom. And um, uh, that seems to be a strain because mineral collectors are used to passing around rocks and stone stuff. And uh, here, you want a piece of this, take that home. And, and we can't do that by Zoom. So it's kind of disappointing. So we're hoping we can someday soon get back to having real meetings with real rocks. But yeah, at the moment, we're limited to Zoom. And if people wanted to find out more information about the Baltimore Mineral Society, where would they, where would they go if they wanted to? We have a website. And uh, uh, so uh, BaltimoreMineralSociety.org. And uh, you can look us up. You can you can Google us. You can Google anything. Google us, uh, and you can find our website. Um, and uh, we're hoping for better times, and I think they're coming. Yep, we had a we had plans to have a rock swap um, and start doing that as an annual um, uh, event with the Natural History Society. It was on the calendar and everything, but COVID hit. So stay tuned. Oh, a rock swap. I, I like to hear about rock swaps. Mm -hmm. Ugly rocks that other people won't take home. Uh, you break them up, there's pretty stuff sometimes. Yep, I, you've given us a whole lot to think about and, and I think you have um, inspired us to go look at the world in a different way. And so thank you so much, Mike, for sharing your knowledge. You're welcome. With us. It's been wonderful. Any other questions for Mike before we sign off for the evening? Thank you. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you and bye. Bye bye. It's like you're getting a standing ovation, Mike. So. Wow. <laughs> um, at any rate, everybody have a wonderful evening. Stay safe, and I hope to see you all at one of our upcoming presentations that, and programs that we have coming up. So stay connected and stay curious, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mike. That You're was welcome. Fun. Thank you.